Hi, it's Jay. Usually when you hear my voice this early and it's just me, you know what's about to happen. This episode had a lot, a lot of problems and unfortunately scheduling issues that spanned weeks prevented us from being able to redo it. I have tried to save it as much as humanly possible, but be aware going in. There's a lot of lag on my end specifically, some audio level issues as well, but mostly it's the lag. I have attempted to redub areas, I have attempted to do everything that I can to make this presentable, but this is what we have, and I apologize for it. Thank you for your patience with us. I appreciate it. If you want to skip out on this one, I understand, but I did my absolute best to make it workable. Love you all so much. Thank you again for your patience. On with the episode. Mr. The Ebert, your website sucks today. Uh, I'm pretty sure Mr. The Ebert's website tried to give me a virus a couple weeks ago when I went looking for the actual review itself to read along. That was really the, that was the week I went I have... away in the middle of an episode because my computer hard reset, my screen started flashing, and like everything went dark, and I uh, is the to... computer okay now? hard shut my computer down and then come back up and run a virus scan when I popped back into the uh, Skype call. But I would just use caution. My whole screen just froze. Okay, that was just because I opened OBS. Are you on Rod Ebert's website? <laughs> I think Roger Ebert is just haunting his website from beyond the grave. Listen, we can't make accusations like that. We will go back. I, I gotta court. stop dunking on dead people. It's been a couple of weeks of me just dunking on dead people. Welcome to Star Wars Every Week Forever, the podcast in which we watch one Star Wars movie every week forever. This week, you know, they say the Jedi returned, but I don't believe it. Because, like, the the return in the movie is Han. It's a Han thing. Like, they're there to save Han. And Han's no Jedi. Ben, how's your watch? Uh, surprisingly pleasant. I, I watched Return of the Jedi this week with someone who likes Star Wars and doesn't watch it every week. It's always a nice welcome change, isn't it? It is. Uh, plus, it has my third favorite pod race in it, so. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Just getting them in early. Ben's starting strong out of <laughs> coming early. I don't think I've ever, for an episode, watched one of these movies with someone that's not involved in the podcast, so that sounds like a wonderful experience I would like to have at some point. Chris, how was your watch? That was fine. <laughs> I, it's not It's not one of my favorite movies. It's it's pretty much the one I can take or leave at any point, so... What about first podcast guest? First podcast guest, how was your watch? Do you feel about... How do you feel about Return of the Jedi? Do you have any thoughts or opinions? Do you prefer to keep them to yourself? Mm, that's fair. That's fine. That's fair. I um, I was not happy about watching the movie, but it went fine. Uh, I watched like, it yesterday afternoon, unhappily. Jay, how is that different than any other watch? That... It isn't. <laughs> I say it so many times. Like, sometimes I'll come in with a new, like... It was shit because of this. This week, I just didn't want to, and then I did, and it was fine. I was angry again at several scenes for just existing. Like, I was angry at Leia again for playing coy when she says she loves Luke because she knows what she's doing. She knows what she's doing. She knows what she's doing. But other than that, it was a Jedi watch, like usual, unfortunate. They're not terrible. You You do have strong opinions on Leia in this movie. I mean, I really don't. It's just, like, she's in a very specific mood in this movie that's very <laughs> coy in, like, a sarcastic way. Um, I personally like to define the way Leia is in this movie as a woman written by a man. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that's, yeah, yeah. that's every Star Wars movie ever written, I mean. Yeah. Yeah, like. <laughs> yeah. Just, oh. Okay. 
But anyway, that's why it was an annoying watch for me. Not because of Leia, but because I was annoyed at every scene in the movie. And therefore, I was annoyed at every character. Because I don't like these people anymore. I think they're all terrible and I don't want to spend any time with them anymore. But I have to. <laughs> it's such a... Chris is considering deeply those words. No, I mean, because it, it really is just like a strong break that like i mean we talk and bitch about these movies constantly but like uh that's that's a very like it's a personal like grudge that you have now against these characters it's like I have a personal I... grudge against this movie there's too many weird alien tongues in it you are correct Dad. like so many of them about this movie <laughs> Like like an excessive amount of them. And I really was very aware of them this watch. Do you think director who I can't think of the name of like his thing that apparently like George was like, no, get out of the way, I'm gonna do this. Do you think that was his input? I bet that sounds like a Richard Marcand, friend of the show. Richard Richard Marcand. Richard Marcand, who they talk shit about in the Blu-ray incessantly. Why do they why do they talk shit? What what did Richard do? Uh, they just directly in the blu-ray they're like we just felt like he was in over his head he wasn't used to this kind of style he was he did wasn't used to directing these kind of movies and like dude bury him softly brother now dude was like but george do they all have to show their tongues (laughs) george was like you don't know what you're doing of course they need their tongues where's uh what was this guy's name again richard Richard (laughs) marquand Where's, where's, the, where's the maybe? where's the Mark Vaughn cut of this movie? <laughs> I mean, the Mark Vaughn cut. You know, there's do we have a, do we have a script little, for his version we can do like we did the Favaro cut. cut. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, I mean fascinating. He was just brought on, right? but yeah. Wow. But yeah, that's how I feel about these movies. It's like a required dinner with. Uh, extended family every week and then this is the part of afterward where i get to sm- stand outside and smoke a cigarette with the people i like in the family that's what the po- actual recording of the podcast is it's a smoke circle you know who i'm not sick of that's who? a lie roger ebert's review of <laughs> <laughs> Oh, what a great segue. How could you possibly be sick of Roger Ebert's reviews, especially after last week brought us my favorite moment on the podcast of all time? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty great. We're just a React channel now. Audience, if you're just joining us again, we're just a React React channel channel now. We do, in fact, have two reviews of Return of the Jedi once again, and not one review, and Roger... Roger Ebert being quiet as Siskel gets very, very angry at the man that shall not be named anymore. But yes, we have two reviews of Return of the Jedi canonically in real time, not very long after that particular debate. One from May 25th, 1983, and one from Load Website. <laughs> March 14th, 1997. So this is a four-star review. I, I'm starting to think that I did not know this, and Roger Ebert only scores out of four because I've never seen even the ones that we've been like, what would he score it in? I've never seen one above four, so I don't know. But Would have been, would have been five stars. This is, was that this is the done? same. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're just one small moment in return of the Jedi, a moment you could miss if you looked away from the screen, but a moment that helps explain the special magic of the Star Wars movie. Luke Skywalker is engaged in a ferocious battle in the dungeons beneath the throne room of the loathsome Jabba the Hutt. His adversary is a slimy, gruesome reptilian monster made of warts and teeth. Definitely not reptilian, he's amphibious. I, I feel like, well, what, he wouldn't be amphibious, he would be, um... Mammalian. Worm. <laughs> Mammalian? Sure, Hold he's on. got tits. Hold on. He's got boobies. Sure, he's got tits <laughs> might be one of my favorite lines that ever come out of this podcast. Just <laughs> Ben, Ben, just for the record, you, Ben, Ben, you, said on the, this podcast, sure, he's got tits. Sure, Jabba the Hutt's got tits. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Ben specifically said this. 
Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's a thing that I, Ben, said. I mean, that Ben definitely said. Uh, <laughs> I, I I just thought they were, like, folds, like, like fat folds. I didn't realize they were I don't, the Zonga Zongas. Uh, Jesus. I mean, what else is that other than that to begin with, I guess? But uh, <laughs> on a real technical level, I guess, but... No, I mean, yeah, I would. I, is it? I, I would say reptilian more than I would say amphibious, right? Like, do they? I don't know. Do rank orders lay eggs. It's giving. He get. Do they? Do they do, feed their young are, with milk? Chris, you're asking too much about the biology of huts right now. And we know so they're much. androgynous. We know that they. There, there is so much. Uh, extended lore in the star wars universe in like the eu i guarantee this question has been answered somewhere this this question has been answered on the podcast do they are have tits? androgynous do rank we're talking about java i thought we were talking about rancors no we're talking about java oh. we're getting to the rancor welcome to star wars every week forever the podcast in which we uh discuss much like wikipedia what creatures in star wars what aliens what people well. do not have Breasts. In case you were wondering, rancors are classified as a reptile. Mm, that makes sense. I thought that's what we were talking about this whole time. We, uh, this is a breast. <laughs> no, we we're talking about Java. Ah, yeah, Java. Um, is but this and, is... and Java is technically a gastropod. The fuck is a gastropod? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ben. I was looking for it. It was somewhere in the back of my mind. It's a slug. What? Ah. Well, slug. Slug. <laughs> that's. With with boobies. Um, Gastropod. This is a breast heavy episode. It's um. We, this is when we well, really get our Wikipedia on. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say, like, it's in Wikipedia. They talk about breasts a lot. It's, in it's the top trending page on Wikipedia. Breasts are positively Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, they're the most Star Wars, I would say. Yeah. His adversary is a slimy, gruesome rip. Reptilian monster of warts and teeth. Things are looking bad when suddenly the monster is crushed beneath the falling door. And then, here is the small moment, there's a shot of the monster's keeper, a muscle band jailer, who rushed forward in tears. He is brokenhearted at the destruction of his pet. Everybody loves somebody. So, uh, Roger the Ebert was a big fan of um, that know. moment of emotion. We, How have we not turned that gentleman into a bit? Can I... I feel like we have, have we... briefly in the early days. Um, can I with muscle Lando? Bound? Yes. Would we would we describe him as muscle bound? No. I was just that one caught me off no. guard a little bit. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I would describe him as muscle bound. I, I would like to say would... the person I watched the movie with was also very invested in this man's upsetness over the rancor. Oh, he's the best character in the movie. Yeah, this dude's more bum <laughs> than anyone is about anything. Like. Leia's entire home planet gets destroyed. She doesn't react she's nearly as strongly cool. as this yeah. guy does about the Rancor. I think we've talked about him through talking about Lando, where he makes friends with this guy. Yes, we did have a whole thing about think... that, yeah. Because the entire time we were doing the live rotations, we went into a lot of effort of trying to talk about the characters that give us life. I don't think we ever mentioned him, and he's like my favorite. And apparently we, Roger Ebert's favorite. We, do we have a name for this guy? I'm sure we do somewhere in town. Rancor pet owner return of the Jedi. Malakili. Sure. Malakili. That, right. that makes sense. Part of Tended to Jabba the Hutt's Menagerie. I don't like the implications there very much, but okay. All right, Mr. The Ebert's website. Work with me here. Mr. The Ebert. Why are we incapable of giving people normal names or titles on this show? It started as a Ben bit, and we never stopped. <laughs> I don't feel like I'm solely responsible for this. <laughs> you I feel are solely responsible for this. You must stay with me. That's no, I feel it's inaccurate. Accurate. It is a thing that you do that we pick up. And because we share a brain now, we have all picked it up yeah. from you. There are many things Podcast that I do that I have picked up from you, Ben. I can't wait until Chris's child refers to him only as Mr. The Dad. Mr. The Dad? <laughs> I, 
I do not I do not want to eat my vegetables, Mr. The Dad. I think special guest is flying out again. He's too expensive to book for the whole show. Oh, uh, yeah, we're too expensive. <laughs> Say farewell to Mr. The Dad, first podcast guest. <laughs> Give back my hand. <laughs> I well, shall not we're gonna get I shall not three. With you, Mr. The Dad. We'll get three quarters of Mr. The Dad back for the rest of the podcast. Look, I'm I'm fine with that. <laughs> if people stop calling me Daddy, all right? I got too many. People, not my child calling me that nope, these days. Moving so. on. <laughs> it, is the, it is the extra level of detail that makes the Star Wars pictures much more than just space operas. Other movies might approach a special effect. Other action pictures might approximate the sense of swashbuckling adventure. But in Return of the Jedi, as in Star Wars and The Empire Strikes Back, there's such a wonderful density to the canvas. Things are happening all over. They're pouring forth from imagination so fertile that, yes, we do halfway believe this crazy galactic empire long ago and far, far away. Return of the Jedi is both a familiar movie and a new one. It concludes the story of the major human characters in the saga, particularly Skywalker, Han Solo, Princess Leia, and Darth Vader. It revisits other characters who seem either more or less than human, including Ben, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Yoda, Chewbacca, and the beloved robot C-3PO and R2-D2. If George Lucas persists in his plan to make nine Star Wars movies, this will nevertheless be the last we'll see of Luke, Han, and Leia, although the robots will be present in all the films. This is a little oh, piece God. of... Uh, only you knew. This is a little uh, uh, forgotten George Lucas lore because it's actually also in the special features and they use it in the Rise of Skywalker Blu-ray of people talking about how George was promising nine movies during yeah. Return of the Jedi. We've, and then uh, George said for years that that was not the case. We've talked about that a little bit uh, on the podcast too. Like it came out a while back, like he talked about his original plans for uh, seven, eight, and nine. Yeah. Um, and it got, he weird, wanted, of course. He wanted to use, it was essentially the same thing with uh, Luke, but with a different main character, uh, and he wanted to use Darth Talon and Darth Maul somehow? Yep, Darth Maul was going to be the main villain. Um, they were going to go I a lot more into the lore. No, I'm, um, I'm pretty sure, if I remember correctly, he was planning on bringing the original cast back. Yes, well, I mean, was gonna, Luke was, was gonna, coming uh, back was, for sure. It was going to delve into uh, a lot of the like stuff with like the wills and all that yes weird mystical jedi bullshit the one one thing that survived was the luke and ray um relationship uh but ray would have been like 12 which mm -hmm. and george lucas decided to use darth talon let's all be honest of a man that hates the eu and never wanted canonized we all know why he specifically chose darth talon let's not pretend why he was like, oh, Darth Talon, I can use her. Bleh. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Georgie boy. Uh, Play with my ahead. ball. I will pop it so you can't have it anymore. Ah, second podcast guest. Oh, I thought you were talking about your cats. I am talking about your cats. I was going to call them second and third podcast guests. <laughs> No, they're in the window. <laughs> the story in the Star Wars movies is, however, the only part of the film and a less crucial element as time goes by. What Jedi is really giving is a picturesque journey through the imagination and an introduction to forms of life less mundane than our own. In Jedi, we encounter several unforgettable characters, including the evil Jabba the Hutt, who is a cross between a, a toad and a Cheshire cat, the lovable cuddly Ewoks, the furry inhabitants of the forest mode of Endor, a fearsome desert monster made of sand and teeth. That was before they made the weird tentacle parts of it in the special features. Uh, I wonder if he has, like, historically not really seen any of the differences in uh, in the special edits. I wonder if he'll notice that, because that's a charm difference. <laughs> well, the thing, I mean, the thing he never brought up, which astounds me, is he never brought up how much they changed Jabba. So... Oh, he did bring that up, but it was just offhanded. I think I think when that A New Hope decision was made, like, he brought up the difference. But, it, it, like, it goes back to that quote he made in Phantom Menace, um, how quickly we get used to, uh, how quickly we get used to large wonders. It's the, it's the quote that he said where 
he had compared it to uh, people that had never seen the stars and, except for every hundred years. And when they see it, they go insane. That's what he was talking about in CGI. And then Attack of the Clones came. And it's like, it's all flat. I don't know what I'm looking at. So I guess he was very forgiving of Jabba and the many creatures in the back. I want to know how forgiving he was of uh, Hentai Monster and um, uh, the musical number, which, by the way, is my favorite part of the movie now. I get tremendous enjoyment out of the musical number. Yeah, you've been, um, you've been that a just fan sets... of this musical number the last couple of rotations. <laughs> because it brings me joy because it ruins the movie. I enjoy it greatly. It's fantastic. And awesome. that that creature in the musical number makes me deeply, deeply frightened of what George Lucas is into sexually. <laughs> <laughs> because she's supposed to be sexy. You know that. You you know that their yeah. intention is that she's sexy. And, and she's, she's super. Ooh. Well, I mean, we've, we've talked before on the show about how we just know for a fact that George Lucas just Knows the least about sex of any yeah. person who has children. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's pretty clear from everything. Yes, we we know on the on the scale from foot fetish to furry, he's a scaly. It's it's clear. <laughs> I uh, is is scaly like beyond furry? It's, I don't know. It's like Ben, you're an lizards and stuff. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. It's well, it's lizards it's and stuff. Scaly. Is um. Weird. But I, on it's, the it's spectrum between furry and generally like, like more after- concerning than furries, yeah. Okay, so be beyond furry. Thank you, yeah. you are an expert on this subject. Um, I appreciate it. People who are more into, you know, cloaca, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah, at least okay. furries, it's mammalian still. I had a whole, <laughs> I had a whole like twenty minute conversation with my wife a few weeks back about cloacas. Mm. I don't remember the context. Would you put your hand in one? (laughs) (laughs) I I think George Lucas would. (laughs) Uh, I'm going to move us on before this is the second time we look up Rule 34 on the podcast. (laughs) And hateful little rat-like creatures that scurry about the corners of the frame. And there is an admiral for the Alliance who looks like the missing link between a Tyrannosaurus Rex and Charles de Gaulle. I'm, I'm, who is Charles de Gaulle? You don't know who Charles de Gaulle is? is? You should know who Charles de Gaulle is. Oh my god, nope, yep, nope, sorry, nope, I recognize, sorry, I apologize sincerely, it took me a second. Listen, seeing a, a written name and faces are two different things. I am a visual recognizer, I am not a name recognizer. We apologize to all our listeners from France. <laughs> I apologize to our listeners from France deeply. One thing that these movies never do is waste a lot of time on introductions. Unlike a lot of special effects and monster movies, where new creatures are introduced with laborious setups, Jedi immediately plunges its alien beasts into the thick of the action. Maybe that's why the film has such a sense of visual richness. Jabba's throne room, for example, is populated by several weird creatures, some of them glimpsed in the corner of the frame. The camera in Jedi slides casually past forms of life that would provide the centerpiece for a lesser movie. The movie also has, of course, more of the amazing battles in outer space, the intergalactic video games that have been a trademark since Star Wars. And Jedi finds an interesting variation on the chase sequence in Star Wars, where the space cruisers hurtled through the narrow canyons on the surface of the Death Star. This time, there's a breakneck chase through a forest to board an airborne motorcycle. See, uh, even Roger Ebert podcast. likes my third favorite yes. pod race. <laughs> uh, Roger Ebert was a big fan of the pod race, so I figured he would like this very much. <laughs> Roger Ebert loved that fucking pod race. What yeah, isn't to love? Yeah. 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 After several bad guys have run into the trees and gotten creamed, you pause to ask yourself why they've simply flown up the treetops. But never mind, it wouldn't have been as much fun way. I don't know if that's how speeder bikes work, but... I don't think that's how speeder bikes work, Roger. No, I... But, like, like why wouldn't it, though? It's the 80s. The concept of the hovercraft was around by then. And we know that the hovercraft needs a certain proximity to land to function. Because it's about the land uh, resistance against the... Come on, Roger, get it right. What do you do? 
I question your knowledge of Star Wars lore. <laughs> At least do the research, Ebert. buddy. Just nerds in the 70s furiously <laughs> writing letters to Roger Ebert. Mr. Ebert, I was very angry with you. <laughs> it's like the back of a comic book yeah. from from early days of comic books, just like a, a, a form letter, and then basically the writer's going, hey, good point, fuck you. <laughs> a Return of the Jedi is fun, magnificent fun. The movie is a complete entertainment, a feast for the eyes, and a delight for the fancy. It's a little amazing how Lucas and his associates keep topping themselves. <laughs> From the point of view of simple movie-making logistics, I don't know if they... I'm glad my brain was not the only one to do that. I'm glad... Carry on. <laughs> Nothing to see here. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> We're children. We're absolutely children. Uh, ben and I both lost it immediately. Yeah. <laughs> all I can see... I don't have Skype up, so I'm just getting one of you at a time, and all I saw was Ben fall forward trying not to laugh. Very good. From the point of view of simple movie-making logistics, the, there is an awesome amount of work on the screen in Jedi. Twice so, as many visual effects as Star Wars in the space battles, Lucas claims. So what Roger just said. The fact what that Roger the said, of, from a certain point of view, you know, these... I hate you. <laughs> I hate you terribly. I hate you so deeply. The fact that the makers of Jedi are able to emerge intact from their task having created a very special work of the imagination is the sort of miracle that perhaps Obi-Wan should have known something about. And that is the 1983 review. He's making a good point. I do yes. like how he goes on and on and on about how good looking these movies were. And the person I watched the movies with and I discussed how everything in Star Wars is so ugly deliberately by design. Yes, a thousand percent. <laughs> Like, percent. like other sci-fi, like Star Trek or Stargate, everything is so clean yeah. and pretty, and then Star Wars is just grungy. Well, if you remember, in the original Star Wars review, he talked about how he compared it to 2001 A Space Odyssey and how they decided not to use um, aliens. And he <laughs> said, look at the Tatooine cantina scene there's proof that you can do it and and we were kind of like yeah it, it's proof you can do it i'm sure the guy in the devil mask would and the werewolf mask would would have worked perfectly in 2001 it a space odyssey great. mr the ebert wouldn't have completely <laughs> ruined the tone or anything no 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 not at all that's when we discovered you know uh, and, that you had never seen 2001 space odyssey <laughs> yes I'm just glad that there's only, out of all of these, there's only one Star Trek dig out of all of the reviews, or the original reviews anyway. Because apparently, Roger Ebert did not like Star Trek. Well, to be fair, Star Trek in the that. 60s was kind of really hacky. Yeah but, yeah, but he made that comment during Phantom Menace, and it upset me. Yeah, so, you can't say that once you've seen The Next Generation. TNG... Deep Space Nine was out, like... Yes, I, I concur. Can't say that for sure when you watch Deep Space Nine. Hi, Chris. <laughs> uh, uh, I, uh, Deep Space Nine, yeah, if you can't, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh. I'm getting a an ad for the Wolverine Deadpool Weapon X volume. That's gross as hell. It's uh, it's famously the comic where um, Sabretooth uh, is a pedophile. Oh, why am oh, I getting an ad one. for that? Uh, yeah. yeah. On on Roger Ebert's website. Yeah. Well, oh. well, it's I I buy a, I buy a lot of comics. <laughs> I buy a lot of comics. It's it's Google advertising. It's either comics, video games, um, uh, uh sapphic. Uh, uh, writing or products or um, uh, condoms for some reason. Return of the Jedi, uh, March 14th, 1997. Uh, the special edition release. Return of the Jedi completes the epic Star Wars cycle with the final destruction of the Empire and the inevitable, inevitable face-off between Luke Skywalker and the evil Darth Vader, now revealed as we surmise to be his father. The film has a tone of its own. If Star Wars was a brash space opera and The Empire Strikes Back was a visual feast, Return of the Jedi is a rite of character invention. 
We get a good look at Jabba the Hutt and his court. We meet the fuzzy wuzzy Ewoks for a man that, <laughs> that takes great pride in his uh, uh, wordplay. Fuzzy wuzzy Ewoks is an interesting decision. Yeah, it sure is. Also, what movie was he watching? Because he called him like cute and cuddly or something in the last one, and now like he called him this. Did he not see that they were just straight up eating people? I don't think most people do until they've gotten on our insane setting via pain parade traps to murder stormtroopers. Which I mean, it, that's cool, but I wouldn't call him cute just... and cuddly. Well, clearly he's like watched the Ewoks cartoon between this right. time and his last one. And they are <laughs> cute and cuddly in that. Ewoks cartoon. Yeah. And we are confronted by two wonderfully loathsome creatures. The beast in the dungeon beneath Java's throne room and the desert monster made of teeth and gullet. If he I had to choose, break I would monsters say down to like the their parts. Yeah, he uh, he really likes yeah. to dissect the various creatures of the Star Wars universe. He was the kind of kid that greatly enjoyed dissecting dissecting uh, animals in biology class. I think. Oh he's man, that probably the mangala of reviewers. <laughs> That was That'll definitely set us back. A hell of a reference. Just that's what a lie. <laughs> if I had to choose, I would say this is the least of the Star Wars films. It lacks the startling or originality of the first two. It's more concerned with loose ends and final resolutions. It was the correct decision for George Lucas to end with the trilogy and then move to another point in time for a continuation of the saga. To return to these characters a fourth time would destroy the mythic structure of the story <clears throat> and turn it simply into a series. Yeah, it sure would. You're you have right. very strong opinions, I guess. Um, well, yeah. far be it from me to agree with Roger Ebert on something, but <laughs> <clears throat> the man isn't wrong. Listen, I, I agree with a lot of Roger Ebert's takes, except when he brings up a film that shouldn't be brought up ever for comparison. Um, and the fact that he really loved the film General Patton, that one still um, that one still confuses me. Hey, he's an American man of a certain age. Roger Ebert is a, the one... is a man of specific tastes. General Patton and Ewoks. <laughs> and, that's, and Yoda, the best actor in Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where are those uh, contract papers for Yoda to be in the uh, General Patton remake? We're, we're still waiting on it. I think uh, we have to do it for Roger. Okay, but I would watch that. I would 100% watch that. Let's, uh, someone, one of us needs to watch I would also watch that for the wrong so reasons. We can, we can just do like a table read of that Patton script, but in Yoda. Oh, ben gets close. Ben gets pretty close. <laughs> See, this is why we need Danny DeVito. <laughs> oh, Ben, you see, you seem pretty unhappy about that, but I honestly have always thought that your Yoda impression is the best of everybody. You know? Your Yoda impression is very good. Why don't you uh, give us a little bit? Oh, oh no, I have I have a cold enough. today, and uh, Yoda is just uh, a, little, uh, uh, a little outside my uh, oh, skill set today. Just... Just as seriously, I'm sorry I didn't listen to the uh, to the tenth rotation uh, uh, podcast uh, thing for Return of the Jedi again. I had to wash my hair. No, so no Yoda. Uh, yeah, no, you know that, Yoda? that 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 darn cold I got, man. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's okay. I understand. We don't want to. We don't want to. We don't want to um, uh, have you walking away with no voice. I understand. Yeah, don't I just know in the future you will have to do a Yoda impression for us. <laughs> yes, I I commit Still. to doing my Yoda impression next route, next episode. And I almost feel yeah, like you know, since, that's, since that's we're making rules. like a like an arrangement here, it should be for like an extended period of time. Like you know, you should. Yes. <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna make it up to us for the rest of the rotation, right, Ben? Sure, once an episode for the rest of the rotation, I will do my Yoda impression. Awesome. Great. I'm Thank you so much. Got, I'm glad we got that Still, there contract. are inspired... I'm glad we got... It. It's a verbal contract now. 
still, there are inspired things here. The early scenes are dominated by Jabba the Hutt, whose cavern is populated with lots of small, obnoxious creatures in the corners of the grotesque intergalactic jazz band that seems to have been improvised along with its music. Secure in his lair, Jabba has Han Solo frozen in a sculpture on the wall, and it eventually takes all of our heroes captive. His gurgling voice is wonderfully reprehensible, and he squats beneath his cavern ceiling like a stalagmite of slime, in parentheses. It has been observed that Java seems much larger here than in Star Wars, which he means a new hope. Some say it is because he is on a platform. Some say it is an optical illusion. I suggest that a hut is a slug, and slugs continue to grow all of their lives. That's really interesting, Roger. Thank you. Is that correct, though? I think that it is, but... That, that is interesting, Roger. Are you, are you the foremost expert on slug growth? He just, um, his hobby wasn't, uh, movie watching. His hobby was slug collecting. It's a big slug guy. Much like Jabba. Uh-oh, come here, Google. <sighs> <laughs> Are you Googling if Roger was a slug guy? No, I'm Googling I feel Googling like that's going to take you some continue. weird places. Slugs continue. I feel like between me and Ben, we should know this. To grow. Do slugs but continue when, to when, Italy? What when, does that mean, Google? <laughs> Who's asking you this? One of the autocomplete. Do slugs continue slugs. to Italy? Slugs grow to a specific length. <laughs> oh, so Roger was wrong. Okay, that's what I thought. Roger was wrong. Also, I googled do slugs continue to Italy, and the first result is an Italian slug conquers the world. I didn't know oh, Java was Italian. That's a great character. Can we start doing Italian Java the Hutt as a fucking character on the podcast? Hey, I'm I so don't have an Italian accent. <laughs> Uh, I've been told well, no, my wife that my Italian it, accent like, is deeply uh, offensive. Uh, so. <laughs> Genetic research reveals the origin, diversity, and colonization yeah. history of the invasive <laughs> of the invasive tramp slug. Oh my god, there's some up here. Uh, I want to read this so bad on the podcast, but we can't. But I'm going to give a, a shout out to Seckenberg's World of Biodiversity article uh, on <laughs> an Italian slug conquers the world. Fascinated. Thank you very much Italian for slugs. that. So, it's, so it was basically um, the Columbus of the slugs world. <laughs> it's fucking not inaccurate. <laughs> we are off the fucking rails. The monster in the dungeon made of teeth and scales is the embodiment of disgusting aggression. What? And yet it's death per... What is with Roger and, yet, it, and the blank made of blank? What is why is that his go-to descriptor for fucking everything? He's got to get to he's got to get to two thousand words. I bet, like that's probably part of it. It's totally a word count patter. One hundred percent. Look, I've been there. I, I can I can be a bit of a word count there. stretcher at times. There's more efficient ways. Like you're you're shorthanding yourself. You could go on a much longer explanation. It's always that same format. Are you saying that the foremost reviewer of movies is an uncreative hack? I mean, oh. he, uh, he, review, he reviews other people's creativity, not his own. Let's be, let's be real. I didn't hear a no, so we're going to go with we that's have. a yes from Chris. Yeah, absolutely. Just because he eats a ben, thesaurus every ben morning for in. breakfast doesn't mean he gets to... <laughs> Ben walked in here with a very distinctive and new opinion of Mr. The Eber, and I appreciate it. I, I appreciate the worldview. I'm not saying he's wrong. I'm just saying he's not very creative about the way he expresses it. <laughs> the monster in the dungeon made of teeth and scales is the embodiment of disgust and aggression, and yet its death provides one of the movie's finest moments. The creature, he still, all these years later, loves that scene, and I appreciate him for it. The creature is crushed beneath a heavy door, and then we see the keeper come forward, weeping to have lost his pet. It's a throwaway moment, but typical of the film's richness. 
An extended sequence takes place in the desert where Java's hovercraft positions itself over the creatures in the sand, which seems to consist primarily as a large digestive system. He intends to force his captives to walk the plank, but the tables are nicely turned. I have always felt Lucas lost an opportunity here. Since Java obviously must die at some point, why not feed him to the sand thing? I can envision the hut's globular body slithering along the plank and plopping down into the big open mouth, and yeah, then being you spit up again as to, uns <laughs> as to unsavory even for this eating machine. Final shot, green gooey Jabba stuff dissolving in the monster's digestive juices under a pitiless sun. I, um, Roger, I think we just confirmed that Roger Ebert definitely had an AO3. I know we talked about it a little bit in a previous episode of this rotation. That was very hyper-specific. He's very into Vore, apparently. Cool. I was about to say, Roger Ebert, Vore expert. Oh, man, we're going back to Hellcourt. Fuck. We are going to Hellcourt. I don't think we can take three cases on at once. It's okay. You know a legal I don't think we can take three cases on at once. I do know a legal professional. Is our legal professional friend um, cleared to handle hell court, though? In hell, specifically? Is that within that his may be the separate? That may be the only court they are cleared to handle. <laughs> Wonderful. The Ewoks, never referred to by name in the film, are cute and bring a kind of innocence to the forest moon, where the power station for the orbiting Death Star is located. Their forest provides the location for the movie's most inexplicable sequences in which characters chase one another on a high-speed hover scooter. As you know, if you have seen the film, and USA Today assures us the average American has seen it several times, we sure have, bad guys regularly get wiped out by running their scooters into trees. Question, isn't a thickly forested area the wrong venue for these vehicles? Roger's getting into our kind of complaints now, yeah. we've definitely yeah. said this many times. How about flying above the treetops where there's nothing to run into? He, this is the first time in like these double reviews where he's repeated something. This third movie lacks the resonance that Obi-Wan and Yoda brought to the second. They make cameo appearances but are not major players. We see a great deal more, however, of Darth and the Emperor, who looks uncannily like death in the seventh seal. There is, of course, the climactic moment when Vader reveals his real face, allowing the character to become the first in movie history to be played by three actors, body by David Prowse, voiced by James Earl Jones, faced by Sebastian Shaw. By this third installment, I think, we've seen quite enough of the swordplay with laser beams, and those scenes could be shortened. The <gasps> sharper image catalog I see is offering replicas. Yeah, this is a strong opinion he has that he brought up a lot in front of the Sith. The sharper image catalog I see is offering replicas of the lightsaber for $350 to $450. Pricey when you consider the original prop was a photo flash grip. Well, that price hasn't reduced at all. Oh. Although that seems more outrageous for them. <laughs> for them. It's very funny, like, when you look at it as far as inflation goes, that they're basically the same price now, like... A lot of the times, a lot of the lightsabers are, like, yeah. the ones Hasbro makes are around, like, 300 350 Yeah. That's wild. Things change. Star Wars merch being uncannily expensive does not. I'm going to go buy a, a knitted blanket that has no features that is <laughs> 120 bucks about Star Wars, apparently. Deeply upsetting. At the end of it all, after three movies, we've taken an epic fantasy journey. Lucas has in common with all great storytellers the ability to create a complete world. These films may spring from space opera, science fiction, and Saturday serials, but they are done so superbly that they transcend all genres and become a reverberating place in our imaginations. Thinking back over the three, I find that, that the most compelling characters, Darth Vader, Yoda, and Obi-Wan Kenobi, that is because their lives and thoughts are entirely focused on the Force. To the degree characters have distance from the Force, they resonate less. Skywalker is important, although boyishly shallow. The princess harbors treasured secrets. But Han Solo, for all of his importance to the plot, is not very interesting as a person. And a little of Chewbacca, as observed earlier, goes a long way. Wow. He's kind of right about Han. Han's just kind of there in this movie. The droids, R2-D2 and C-3PO, play much the same role here as their originals did in the movie that inspired them. Kurosawa's The Hidden Fortress. Their team, 
They're a team, Laurel and Hardy or Vladimir and Estragon. Estragon. Estra I never have known how to pronounce that. Help. Yeah, put it in the chat. It's a name, Estragon. You have a pronunciation? Oh, it's, um, oh, sorry. Yeah, I've heard you, I've heard you have chat. some fascinating pronunciations of words in this, so I just you saying it, I can't help you here. I don't. It's literally estrogen with an O. Oh, I know. It's actually not. Estragon. Estragon, yeah. Estragon. His name is the French word for Terrigen. Okay. Whatever. It's fine. Estragon. And then the French can be very mad at me again. I don't know. I don't know why I'm specifically here to piss off the French. Um, I apologize. I don't mean to. It's Played fine. together by fate and by fate and personality. The other characters, Lando, Jabba, the Grand Moff Tarkin, and the many walk-ons and bit players function, in Elliot's words, to swell the progress of a scene or two. At the end, what are we left with? Marvelous sights. The two Death Stars, the lumbering war machines on the snow planet, space warfare, the desert monster, buccaneering action, marvelous sounds, the voices of Darth Vader, Jabba, and the chirpy little R2-D2. And an idea, the Force, that is encompassing everything may perhaps encompass nothing and conceal another level above or beneath. I'm guessing that will be the subject of the next trilogy. And that <laughs> is Mr. The Ebert's final Star Wars review that we're doing. Well, he has some opinions. It's so sad, though. He has opinions that are not necessarily um, popular opinions. Um, I I like this prequel reviews the best because he was just like, fuck the fans. But also fuck the people that hate these movies. They're fine. <laughs> is, um, I'm going to ask him because, one, he was great for capital C content, baby. And two, uh, I wish we could have that guiding hand in the sequel trilogy. It was really nice to just have something to fall back on for this rotation for a while these these have really driven the episodes yeah um i don't know what the hell i'm gonna do for the sequel trilogy i wish there was a contemporary that was like mr the ebert uh we could do in today's age but it's the age of the everyone reviews things well, and i'm not just gonna grab a random person many fucking reviews and i don't know who's i would like trust enough um uh we could we and watch uh I we could we could watch the video reviews that Kevin Smith does at every movie where he just cries. No. <laughs> no. Kevin Smith to death. No, every good, time he thank sees you. a movie, he posts a video review of it where we, he's just weeping. We um, we both like Kevin Smith. Love Kevin Smith. We so both much, dunk on, on him the every time he's brought up, and then because, be I even mean, more dunking that I am not okay with. Look, I, I listen to so many of his podcasts. That's his whole career is dunking on himself. I mean, it's. <laughs> I, I want to know what it is about Kevin Smith that makes him so popular as a celebrity that at a recent convention in Canada, his children were both there as guests. Oh, because he did a movie with his children. He um. Well, Kevin Smith only has the one kid. Yeah. Or were you referring he, to Jason Mewes? Because uh... basically, yeah, oh. yeah, that's that's, that's oh. the thing. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. Yeah, well, I mean Jason Mewes. You know, um, people, people like Jay and and yeah, now Harley Quinn is uh and yes, that's her real name, Harley Quinn Smith. Yeah, that's her real yeah. name. Harley she's Quinn. also you know an actress. Or she's child. been in a few of his movies. She's done some other stuff. Wasn't um, didn't he do a movie with? And this is unfortunate. Uh, this is an unfortunate mention with uh, his daughter and Johnny Depp's daughter, yep. and that's why, yeah. Um, yoga. Hosers. Yeah, yoga hosers. That's why. Yeah. Bad movie. Unfortunate bad movie. mention. Hey, Kevin, I love you. It was a bad movie. Miss. <laughs> I watched Tusk, More and I haven't Tusk. listened to a thing Kevin Smith has said since. Tusk was uh, Tusk was the better version of Human Centipede. Ah. <sighs> I've never watched Human Centipede, but I have watched Tusk. Bad movie. I know. That, that statement put a taste in my mouth, Chris. Yeah, well, yeah, it's, it's a very specific have, type of genre. I have tremendous regrets about watching Tusk. Tusk yeah. fucked me up, but not in a way that it was a good movie, just in a way that it fucked me up. Yeah, that sounds right. 
I respect that Kevin Smith just does whatever the fuck he wants. Um, but he's Kevin Smith, and Kevin Smith is good at a few things. Why am I dunking on Kevin? I'm still waiting, Kevin. Kevin Smith, hey, we're sorry. We don't mean to me. talk on you. Come on, Kevin the show. Smith. I'm Kevin, still waiting for. Uh, I'm still waiting for Moose Knuckle. You've been talking about that movie for like a decade and a half. I'm waiting. <laughs> about the evil moose that <laughs> kills people. It's Cujo, but with a moose. Especially the way. Already. Especially. Especially the way he's talking now, where um, Clerks Three might be his final movie. No, they're starting. They're in pre-production for Mallrats too. I thought that didn't end up happening. Hi, welcome no, to Star Trek Week Forever, the podcast. Yeah, no, it's happening. The podcast where we just talk about View Askewverse movies. Man. Kevin Smith, make a sequel to Red State, please. <laughs> Red State was actually pretty good. Red movie, State was though. fucking incredible. Red State. Other than Dogma, Red State might actually be his best movie. Why are we talking about Ke- Kevin Smith? Come on the podcast. We're big fans, Kevin even though Smith. we don't Kevin on Smith, you. Please come <laughs> on the podcast. You're the only celebrity I actually like as a person. Dogma was definitely his best movie, though. Dogma easily a thousand percent his best movie, like a million miles only, away. Uh, you're, you're the only celebrity these days that I'm about a hundred percent certain isn't actually a total piece of shit. Secretly, please, uh, please come on the podcast. Uh, Ben, me, you bring us a weird case of Wikipedia. A weird what? case of Wikipedia. I a definitely of- know how to make this happen. Wikipedia. You need help? Yes, Ben, you know, your homepage, <laughs> Wikipedia. All right, I've got it. I got it. It is very short. Okay. <laughs> That's a weird Wikipedia, all right. Um, it is canon. Uh, unidentified Grand Vigoth. Incredible. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, the quote is, the world keeps changing, it seems. The old world is disappearing every day, eh? That's a... <laughs> Very, oh, by by the grand vigas. <laughs> so a very fantasy statement. So he is a Powan male who died in three BBY on Cantonica. <laughs> uh, one grand vigas yeah. of the wandering star. Uh, he held the title for a long period of time. Cle Pastera, who believed the Vygoth's old age had led to the Syndicate's deterioration, hoped to overthrow him and take his place. Both Pastera and the Grand Vygoth were murdered during an auction on Cantonica by Fizen Gore and his droids. This is from a fantastic. Oh, I used an I instead of a Y. Of course, it's Y. It had to be a, Y, right? From the from last a... shot audiobook. <laughs> Yeah, it's from a book that apparently was a tie-in to Solo. Uh, it's a it was a Han and Lando novel. Uh-uh. Ooh, I'm always a fan of when we use uh, the Udapa. Um, man, pawns. I don't know if it's pawns or pawns. The um, the larger of the inhabitants of Udapa. They got real popular after Revenge of the Sith. They're everywhere, and I'm a big fan. Book by Daniel Just, Jose since, Older. Um, Especially since um, uh, the guy who did, I think I've mentioned this on the podcast, the guy that did the uh, main leader of uh, of the Utapa uh, people was just like the most, the best actor in terms of like preparation I've ever seen on a Star Wars set and it behind the scenes. Like obviously the the cast, like the the people that worked with him loved him because he got a significant amount of time because he was just excited. Not because he was in Star Wars, but because he looked at himself in the mirror and went, and went, "Hey, I love this." This author mostly does young adult and middle grade level novels. Is there anything of the um, uh, caliber in terms of titles as uh, Exit Pursued by Bear? Um, there. Well, he has the Shadow Shaper Cipher series, uh, which actually the title sounds that makes awesome. <laughs> Um, as, some, as someone who Daniel has to Jose older. make a strong effort to not have a lisp, that sounds like a nightmare of a title. <laughs> um, he has the Bone Street <laughs> Rumba series with excellent titles such as Battle Hill Bolero and Midnight Taxi Tango. Battle Hill Bolero and Taxi Tango is very good. 
Midnight Tactic yeah. Tango is very, very good. Very good. Um, very good. Yeah, I, I oh, and, and the first of that series is Half Resurrection Blues. That's pretty good. Uh, the cover's a little disappointing, though. Yeah, I'm not mad about the names, so. though. I'm a little disappointed by the cover because it's not a picture of a taxi or somebody tangoing. It's just a, a lady with a cleaver, um, which, you know, cool, pretty cool, always cool, but um, not not either taxi or tango. Um, but I'm really the most excited about his middle school because the Dactyl Hill Squad – it's a dinosaurs. <laughs> There's dinos. They're riding pterodactyls. <laughs> Yo, that's dope. I, I he has a he has a book called Half Resurrection Blues. He has another yeah. one called Salsa Nocturna Stories. Uh, these are very good. I don't know if I'm ever gonna read one of your books, Daniel Jose Older. I'm getting old and it takes a lot to convince me to read a book. Um, but if I did I would definitely read these just based on the titles. You did a great job. Great job. Yeah, I, I, I like... You're very good at writing titles to books. The title is fantastic. I don't know the content, oh but my the title is fantastic. These middle school books look amazing. 1863 and dinosaurs Ooh. roam the streets of New York as the Civil War rages between raptor-mounted armies down south. Magdalis Roca and her friends from the Colored Orphan Asylum are on a field trip when the Drift Riots when the draft riots break out and a number of their fellow orphans are kidnapped by an evil magistrate. Magdalis and her friends flee to Brooklyn and settle in the Dactyl Hill neighborhood where black and brown New Yorkers have set up an independent community, a safe haven from the threats of Manhattan. Together with the Vigilance Committee, they train to fly on Dactyl back, discover new friends and amazing dinosaurs, and plot to take down Riker. <laughs> I'm Someone going to read magic. these books. Um, Order took Magic Treehouse and Dinotopia and just shoved them together in a really wonderful way. I wonder if there's an episode where the kids almost freeze to death in the Arctic. I or hope a book, so. rather. These sound amazing. <laughs> where were these they when do. I was reading middle school level books? Yeah, I mean, like, I had Animorphs and, and Magic Treehouse, and that was it. I mean... Those both are pretty wild. Yeah, They're like pretty pretty wild. But like these would have looked great on the shelf beside my Animorphs books. I, I still have my Animorphs books on a shelf. I I am that kind of person. But this has been Star Wars Every Week Forever. Thank you all so much for listening. Thank you so much, Ben, for your every three week uh, weird Wikipedia. You never fail to amaze. Um, and neither does when we find an artist in their other books, because their other books are always great. And by always, I mean uh, Eggs Are Pursued by There and um, Taxi Tango. Fantastic. Great stuff. This has been Star Wars Ever Ever. We love you all so much. Good night. Good night. Farewell, Mr. The Ebert. <laughs> Good night, sweet prince. <laughs> Good night, sweet prince. <laughs> <laughs> that gets out of Hellcourt, right? That comes. Yeah, sure. Uh, if you enjoyed that episode, why not like and subscribe? Also, share it with a couple friends. Bring them into this hellscape that we've done to ourselves. You can catch brand new episodes every single Wednesday on Spotify, Pandora, YouTube, pretty much every other platform you get your podcasts on. Uh, if you'd like to extend the suffering... You can catch us over on Twitter.com at S-W-E-W-F. We post direct links to brand new episodes every week as soon as we upload them, and uh, you can catch the occasional other dumb Star Wars take, and who wouldn't want that? Catch you guys later.